Happy New Year. Oh, it's the second week we've talked. <laughs> no, we haven't. We've talked last week, didn't we? Oh, we, we talked last week. Yeah, I thought we did. Hey, I'll tell you. I thought we um, did. Let me. Let, I I really enjoyed your conversation with uh, Anthony last week. Anthony, Anthony. Oh, did, oh yeah, it was last week. Thank you. Yeah, oh, very, it was good. That was a very good podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, thought, I got a lot of good feedback about it. Well, Lots it was, of good feedback. It's also very nice. You, you know, it was, and it was very similar to what we were talking about because you know a lot of it we did talk about. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's why it's easy to tie in. So what's going on there? Well, there was a lot of, we had a really good conversation earlier, you know, Judd's still down a little bit and, and Quigley came in uh, um, and was asking some questions about the, you know, the valuation of, of things in, in 99 and that yep. I see securities and, you know, my response and, and I pulled by, you know, bio, you remember Terry Biondo and I, yeah, I yeah, sure. carry into the conversation and, and both of us had really the same answer. Hey, I was busy in the pit trading it. You know, I was I was a young kid. Yeah. I was a young guy learning. I would ask you guys questions and learn from you guys. But, you know, things didn't make sense to me at that point. I was a little bit too busy trying to figure out how to make money in it to, to know right. what was truly happening in a valuation sense. Um, so yeah, that's you know, right. a lot of the questions that that I emailed to you just kind of started coming out of that that conversation. Okay, hold on. Uh, so, all right, hold on. So, let me go back to those questions. Uh, Peter, you're you here. Are, Peter, are you here? Quigley? Yeah, I am. Okay, good. Me? Yeah. Okay, just Cyrus going back to the question so that we can get it. Okay, yeah, let me, let me get out of this and let me go to your question. Okay. So, here's some conversation. Uh, the, let me know if you have time. Okay, that was yesterday. We have some conversations about similarities between now and 1999. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on about this. You know, again, you know, I, you know, as I tell you, I love I love these guys who I sit poolside with because we discuss a lot of these things and these are real investors, uh, not traders. Uh, Cause although, you know, they're learning about uh, and they, and they know these are all, guys in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, mostly 70s and 80s, and they have a lot of knowledge just about life and business. And so when they see a big move, they'll take it, you know, and they won't, you know, well, you know, I got a 30% move in, in three months, well, that's a lot, you know, and they're smart enough to take it. Um, so we're, we're talking about this. Now, 1999, People are going to make the similarities because, of course, Greenspan was pumping massive amounts of liquidity into the market to head off any uh, Y2K disruptions. Okay, and a lot of people attribute the last part of the dot-com bubble to that, as well as to the bailout, or, or I'm sorry, bailout is probably the wrong word. <laughs> the preventing of what Greenspan felt was a uh, systemic uh, financial event if he let long-term capital go. That was probably a major mistake of Greenspan's regime number four, but it was maybe his biggest mistake because he, he truly didn't understand how all this worked, you know, and there, with the leveraging and the shadow banking, he, he didn't, and he panicked, but he felt he could panic and his... Uh, uh, my buddy uh, Jerry from uh, originally from Bridgeport who moved to Oak Park. Uh, when I said that in 2007, I was at, on a radio on a Bloomberg interview with Kathleen Hayes. And I said the difference between what was starting to develop in 2007 and what happened in 1998 with long-term capital is that Greenspan could get the 14 major players who were involved in it, get them in a room, and tell them what they were going to do to extricate themselves and to resolve the situation besides the Fed cutting rates and pumping money into the system. Hmm. In 2007, I said the risks had been, by Greenspan's design, by the way, because Greenspan was a big believer that derivatives were great in um, disseminating risks into a lot of hands, therefore avoiding 
the uh, aggregation of money and creating the systemic risk. Okay, so we know how right he was about that, zero. And Bernanke walked right in his shoes and knew zero about that too. But that's what Greenspan had said. But I said on Kathleen A's, I said, you'd have to rent the Rose Bowl out to get all the people who are at risk. I remember that so, line. Uh, yeah, so Jerry C called me. I was walking out of the studio. I was living in New York. I was working with Solaris Capital at the time. And I'm walking back to work. And my cell phone rings and it's Jerry. And you know Jerry. Um, <laughs> uh, and he says, the greatest line I ever heard. I, he was laughing. He, he said, I can't stop laughing. I said, I know you think it's funny, but it ha- it's absolutely true. There's no, you can't deal with this event whatsoever like that. And it, it bore out. So we knew, we knew that. So this makes, this is not, are the valuations a stretch? Not a chance. Cause I, I don't even know what was the NASDAQ, the PE on the NASDAQ, I think was 70 to one. So we're not there. Yes, we're getting it all done in an aggregation. You know, what did what did I see that fifty uh, percent of the gain last year was Apple and Microsoft? Uh, and if you put the whole things you know, in there, uh, it's it's a great percentage of the move last year. So in that way, but these companies are actually making real money. You know, there's no doubt Amazon's making money. Apple's making money. Uh, Netflix, I'm not sure about. Um, uh, Google certainly making money. Uh, Facebook is making money. So uh, there is definitely money being made. And that makes it somewhat different. But I, I think that valuations are stretched. And that's why I've made, you know, 2020 to me is a relative, you know, if you're going to do relative valuations, uh, I, I think the U.S. is the worst place of a lot of markets. Now, as I talked with you know the guys who I sit with yesterday, and they, they don't really know much about currencies, um, but they're learning. And one guy uh, presented a, a really nice presentation on uh, on currency valuations, and it was a piece of work that John Murphy had been out there putting. It was a YouTube. And anybody could go access it. And John Murphy's a hell of a good technician. So, you know, I, I, so I gave the uh, the presentation was was really good because it followed that. And for a lot of people who don't know, it's a good way to look at it. But these are there's nothing in Murphy's work that we haven't discussed in this room for the last year and a half. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not that's not to pat ourselves. It's just if you're traders, this is what you're paying attention to. So. Can this market, can global equities keep going? Yes. Would a weakening dollar, as we've talked about, aid that? Yes. I think that'll be, that'll at least keep the U.S. Uh, market uh, maybe, you know, steady to high, a little bit higher for the year. But I don't think the U.S. market's going to outperform in any way, shape, or form. Okay. And, and let's make, let's ask ourselves and pose ourselves this question. My assumption this year is that the Fed does nothing. If the Fed does something, it's not good, gentlemen, uh-uh. because they either have to raise rates because they're wrong on inflation, and you've heard their conversations about inflation, by the way, uh, and they're going to let it run hotter uh, than longer because in their minds you can hear the wheels sp- spinning. They're going to smooth out and get an aggregate ag- average to that 2%, which is just such a ridiculous concept anyway. But, you know, again, uh, Hyman Roth, you know, Michael, this is a business we've chosen, so we're <laughs> stuck to deal with it. Uh, and, and we can't do anything else. That's just rea- that's the reality we have. Okay. So uh, we, if the Fed is forced to raise rates, it's because they're getting worried about inflation. If they have to cut rates, there's something else going on in the system that will not be positive. I, I think, you know, as we've talked again, this the Fed being off by a factor of seven, that's, I know, bad math, but I'm going to use it anyway, because they were looking for four rate rises in their predictions for 2019. They actually cut rates three times. So that's mm. that's quite a miss as far as I'm concerned. If you and I missed that badly and held that position all year, we've been broke 
of course, they, they do have that proverbial printing press, so they don't go broke. Um, so so it, it's I, I, I see where people are going because you're getting a little parabolic here. But I'll also say this, and I had this conversation with, with a guy this morning. I said, watch that S&P bond spread that we love so mm-hmm. much. Okay. And again, we talked about this in our last conversation. You go back to October 3rd, when it made its all-time high on 2018 and corrected dramatically. Now, on, two, on October 3rd of 2017 is when it took out the high. Okay, this is, this is a perfect conversation. The, high, the previous high on the S&P bond, and it's just a simple Core, uh, uh, computation. It's the S&P divided by, it's the S&P future divided by the bond future. And that high was made when, Matt? The previous high. The 2007, wasn't it? Or eight? Nope. Nope. December 99. 1999. No shit, okay? really. You're kidding me. That's a, no, and, and I, I put out that blog when we were approaching it in 2017, Jeez. talking about that here we go. If we take this out, we're going to get an upside move. And you oh. can go. Fi- you can go find that blog. It's in the archives. And it said, if we take out, it was 1831 on that cross. Right now, that as I call it, cross. It's, I'm just using. It's just the language. It's at 2088. Yeah. But when it took that out, it went on a straight run to uh, 2118. I believe was the was the all-time high. It might be off a little bit. It's hard on this chart. Now I'm looking at so, 2118, I think. Yeah, and it, so it had a 30% straight-up move, which we discussed when it finally took it out. I said, that's that's a very, very, very uh, aggressive move. And we and I, we talked about it. I remember talking about it. Judd put out pieces about it, and it Let corrected me- quite a bit. Let me let me just let me yeah. back up real quick just to make sure I've got it. Okay. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, two thousand and I remember I I clearly remember uh, taking out the old high of, uh, of October third, two thousand eighteen. I, I mean clearly, and um, and and shorting that level in in the S and P by the way at twenty nine forty four. Um, all right. So October third, two thousand seventeen, we took out the high made back in December of ninety nine. Yep, and that high was sixteen thirty one. That's what I was going to ask. Thank you. And 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 on September twenty seventh, which is the day I wrote that blog of two of two thousand seventeen, that was the quarter close, and we closed above it. And I said, okay, now you now you have something because that that high had held basically for eighteen years. Mm-hmm. That's that, okay. That, that, that's that's great. This is great. Thank you. I I cannot do this any better for anybody. Oh, now you can God. say all these these are these are you know BS numbers. Okay, you don't follow it. But and I used to think that too. And and honestly, I had old Howie put this back together. You're seeing it. But if you go, you know, if we go back using the uh, <laughs> not Globex only, but if we use Pit, I, I'm telling you, as I've told and I and I know I've told the story. I was I was running, and I along the lake. It was uh, my lunch break, and I'm thinking about you know the S and P's. This was like 1991, and I'm going. They can't exist without being tethered to some valuation. So I you know so uh, how he did the core. He went back and did some work on the on the S B bond, and in and in looking at the technicals, he found that the relationship whether or not we can d- discern on a fundamental basis. And I think the fundamentals are relevant that it did track really well. So we started using it. That, this is a fact. I called them from the phone at North Avenue beach. Oh, I was in the middle of my, in my run. So this is when I started looking at this and it's, you can blow it apart because that, but it does. What's wrong. You didn't like that 30, percent move when it took out the high that it had made in December of 99 when it took it out <laughs> you know so September on a quarterly close which was really a great confirmation and it had a straight run so now I'm watching it so for all those who are thinking is it's 1999 
Not that that high is, that's not what the issue is. But if we cannot take out the high from October of, of 17, I'm, I'm sorry, of October 18, I, I know we're, because these are, these dates fall so interestingly, but if we can't take out that high and we fail up here, that's a bad fail on this. <laughs> it sure is. So, you know, I'm just walking you through it. And you see, because we talked about it in, in October of 2018, we talked about, well, wow, you know, this is like 30% move way too much, too yeah. fast. And, and you see the correction you got off of that. And I think yeah. that Judd had done the work and it was a really nice Fibonacci number when you did the swing. So that gave it even more credibility. Uh, that was that, that, um, uh, that, that specific period was the best period of my trading career in, in, in 10 years, uh -huh. the last quarter of the year. And it was based because it was based on, on this exact conversation that Judd and I had had. Yeah. And I just, you know, executed it. Mm -hmm. I, so these are all relevant. So, you know what, look, at, if you're riding this wave, Good on you, baby. Ride it, you know. And and if you think that some things have gotten way overextended, then take it and then look for what you may you may get here. Because if you know, my attitude is this: if this is real, if the economy is as strong as the equity markets are showing, well, then some of the laggards are going to have to perform here. And as things we talked about, things that are involved in global infrastructure development. Um, some of the miners who've really been depressed. I'm not talking about the gold miners. I'm talking about other metals. You know, look at Albemarle, Albemarle, which is a play on, of course. Uh, I'm all I'm all over with, that stock right now. Yeah, I'm which is a play on you know on on the on the uh, lithium batteries. So you know, if you're a believer in this, there are ways. What's the, what's the symbol on that? I'm. I, I'm Alpha bad. Lima Bravo. Alpha Lima Bravo. Yeah, I keep adding an A. And you see where it is. You see the correction, you know, because again, everything gets super hyped up. But these are areas that are worth looking at. You know, look at the move all of a sudden that's happening in Freeport as copper starting to break out. Um, the, these are real. So there are things that you can take some profits in it and move into, especially if you think the dollar is is going to soften in 2020 which i think it is you know it's not doing anything yet and these guys were surprised they said well what's the significant move 10 percent." i said no no when the dollar really wants to move and i had to walk them through the closet accord because they're not foreign exchange sophisticated but they they understand and they said well oh my god and then when you compare when the dollar was really weak and you overlay it with the Bloomberg uh, Commodity Index or the CRB, well, that's a, that. When when the dollar was really at a weak point, the commodities had rallied. That index is was almost uh, uh, two hundred percent higher than where where it is now. So that they understand. So if you pick the right things and you start searching, you know whether it's energy. You know, it's it's like I know people are talking this morning about uh, the energy deal with uh, what you call it, uh, uh, BlackRock. You know, possibly yes. you know looking for okay. So yeah, you know what? But somebody's gonna uh, some somebody's going to 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 buy those you know that's like a classic buffett play if all these big massive funds started divesting and i use that word in its full meaning there uh energy stocks because they're going to be more sustainable well there's going to be opportunities for uh for for some uh for some value investors to latch on to some really good assets you know and Good. I'm not speaking in the social conscious sense. I'm talking about an evaluation set. No, you know, listen, if you're going to go to ESG investing, then you're going to bypass those. But for those who are mercenary and looking for value, okay, you know what? 
when, when the world is ready for whatever it's going to be ready for, good on you. But that's the end of it. Dan, you, you, you make capitalism sound so mercenary. <laughs> I guess it is in many it's, ways. It, it's it's supposed to be. I, know. You know, I, I think you, I, I, I think I think you're right. If this if this you know if if the estimates of are going to start ticking up like the market's telling you, uh, there's a lot of laggards out there you can chase. And so Albemarle I found interesting as well. You see Tesla hitting. Markets all right. want to buy EV cars. They're buying Tesla. Well, they're going to turn around and buy. I think they're going to buy Albemarle because Volkswagen, Toyota, everybody's going to be making electric cars. That's more demand for lithium. So, you know what? I, I, I know that's Pete, right? Yeah, I, yep, I, that's I, I can't see it. Yeah. Okay. So that is so right. And yesterday I, I went back because we had this discussion when I was with these guys. And uh, last year, on January 1st, 2019, the FT had its big read. That's you know, a little more than a year ago. And it was on, uh, I could tell you, where's, where's my article? I have it here somewhere. Here it is. Uh, this was from uh, the FT, January 1st, 2019. The big read was hydrogen power, China backs fuel cell technology. Now, I've traded in and out of Ballard Power, uh, fuel cell, you know, but mostly Ballard Power over the last 20 years. And if you look at that chart, that's BLDP, it's, it's a phenomenal chart on a monthly. It's had runs up to $140, $45. It's been down to $2 last January, two, $2.45. So on January 3rd, when the markets reopened, I actually bought Ballard, not a lot, just I said, you know, I read the article and I, I hadn't known that the Chinese had bought 20 or 25 percent of Ballard Power, which is a Canadian power dealing in fuel cells. But these are things to know about. Now, Ballard Power has said it made a high of like 1080 yesterday. So in a year, it's gone from I bought it at 245 and I'm not bragging because I bought, you know, as they, as they would say in Bridgeport, bupkis. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so really, but I, but I did, when I read the article, I said, wow, this is, this is another one of those alternative energies. So there are those ways to play it. And Pete, I, I think you're right, because if, if Tesla is right, then, you know, lithium batteries and the fuel cell article from the FT and anybody can pull it up. If you go to the archive, it's worth looking at. Now, also fuel cells are heavy users of platinum. More so, don't look at palladium today, by the way. If, if you look at palladium, that's, that move is parabolic. I mean, it's just, you can put up a monthly, a weekly, a daily, whatever you want. Palladium is just insanity. That was the commodity move of the year last year. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I didn't have it. I watched it, and uh, it's just, you know, it's just gone absolutely um, insane. But you you stand in front of that train. I don't. Uh, um, that's a Shinkansen on a uh, on an L track. So uh, <laughs> don't stand in front of it. But these are these are all things. So you can start looking for things. And if you think the the weak dollar, and I'll tell you what, you're you're already starting to see it in the emerging markets. And that was a big part of our discussion yesterday, because in the emerging markets, if I put up, you know, you know. Uh, it's, I've loved the ruble. The peso has certainly been a play in the, and the, you know, Mexico is a little, you'd be a little careful here because there are people questioning the Chinese trade deal. That if the Chinese are going to be buying so much from the U S it's going to come out of other places. So they're getting a little, uh, people are trying to rebalance here going, who's going to be hurt here, but the Mexican pesos above the 200 week and sustaining itself. The rubles above the two, I think it's above the 200 weeks. So you're already getting some interesting moves in the uh, emerging market world. And th that's see, not yeah. risk off here. That is not risk off for U.S. equities, the peso being so strong. No, no, it's not. It's it, But again, that makes it a relative trade. Because as long as, you know, if the dollar starts to weaken, the U.S. equities 
won't necessarily go down. I got news no. for you. know they they may meander here now. As a couple of guys talked about yesterday, well then that ought to, and I stri- and I stress the ought be good for large U.S. corporations with big overseas earnings, because and th- that will be you know probably uh, the S and P or Dow will will probably outperform if that's the case because they'll have a, a weak dollar. But I don't know what that percentage of weak dollar which will drive those better earnings. You know, that that's the key. Will it be a 5% move? Yeah, maybe, you know, tangentially, but nothing. A 10 or 15% move. And I'm not saying the dollar is going to do that because we, as judge, if he was on, he would remind us that that 125 area in the euro, which is really where we're t- talking about getting, if we got through there, then it would be a whole different story. But there is, you know, a minor, and I stress minor correlation with a weak dollar holding up uh, U.S. equities, but I'm not sure how long that will play out because, of course, it'll depend what comes with it. How weak does the dollar get? I'm not looking for any substantial move, but a weak dollar does bode well for the, you know, that's why commodity, you know, so many of the emerging markets are commodity oriented uh, economies, meaning they're producers. And also a weak dollar, as you're seeing it, uh, diminishes the impact of all the dollar debt that they're carrying. It just makes it easier for them to uh, to finance their debt load. So those are those are positives. Those are positives. But will it be that the U.S. I just don't think the U.S. will outperform. Earlier, we were talking uh, along those lines, and it's, I, I don't think I'm switching gears, but just the point of clarification for me, Peter had asked, uh, one of the questions that Peter quickly, Peter wanted to ask was some, was about, was was along these lines, does a strong or weak dollar trigger, you know, a flight to safety or flight to quality? And, and you know, m- the first thought that I had was, what does a flight to safety or a flight to quality even look like these days? You know, they wrote there's a piece in the FT today about the yen really not performing that great mm-hmm. with all that, you know. And we talked about that last week. We, right. You know, it, it had it had a move, but not like it used to. So the the risk on risk off or row row that took part in the uh, you know 2011, 12, uh, or 10. Not you know when, when people were rushing back, but the Japanese have evidently brought you know enough money home because that's why that works by the way why the yen was a safe haven because when the japanese would would get nervous about overseas investments they had so much of it that they were bringing currency home and that would that would put a bid to it has that played itself out or are people just uh disillusioned enough with the yen because of the boj's policies are just uh, they're just they can't be sustained and they know it too and the yen is actually not rallying, even as the JGB yields. Let's see, the last one I have. Hold on, let me see if I can get a fresh one while we're on. Michael, uh, while Michael, while while Judd's looking that up, Michael, can you unmute? Um, I mean, while I was looking that up, can you unmute, Michael? I'd, I'd like you to 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 ask Ira, uh, or I'd like you to discuss to Ira uh, you know, after after you talk about yours with you. Yeah. Hey, Matt, I'm here. All right, hold on just one second. Let Ira answer okay. this, and I'd love you. I'd love to have this All conversation. Right. All right, go ahead. What's what's the question? I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Ira. Mike. You were saying um, hydrogen fuel cells are um, um, go going uh, into production. Yeah. Um, I I don't think I don't think it will be a mainstream. Um, power source for um, consumer vehicles. It's because um, uh, to 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 make hydrogen out of thin air is very hard, and the storage and transportation of hydrogen is um, difficult too. Um, it's very expensive source of energy. You're right, but it's coming down. And that's why, you know, when I read the article, and believe me, Michael, every point you made is a good point. I've had my, I've made money trading it because I don't, you know, because I'm not ridiculously greedy. So when markets have run up over, and the the fuel cells have had 
two or three or four runs over the last 20 years. And I look at them. Um, you know, the article, it's an important article, and I, and I would advise people to read it if you're, if you're interested in this. Um, well, I'm searching for the to a point because every point you make, uh, the guy who's the uh, chair of Ballard, and he says, you're exactly to your point. Uh, it, uh, the, if, you know, to get the economy of scale, they felt that they would have to have 10,000 vehicles, and that's buses, not, not cars. Although Toyota, you know, the Japanese are very involved in fuel cells also. Toyota has a car called the Mirai, right. which actually is, is, is out there. My son, we were, I was with my son in Maryland over the weekend, and we were actually talking about this. Uh, so he was actually uh, offered an opportunity to drive it, but he didn't take it. Um, let's see. But I have a, I'm looking for this point. But find this article. I think you'll really enjoy it because because um, here's you know again uh, they they talk about you know uh, everybody will blow smoke at everybody you know but they were doing the same thing with Tesla. So um, so here. Uh, so they say fuel cells have a number of advantages for China. They can help reduce the country's reliance on imported energy. Okay, we know that. While lithium ion batteries require a host of metals such as cobalt, lithium, and nickel, most fuel cells only require platinum, of which there's an abundant supply as a catalyst. Um, in terms of resources, it's a lot easier to how you do it for fuel cells. Okay. Um, then he says China may also have a solution for being self-sufficient in hydrogen. While most hydrogen is created from fossil fuels such as methane and used in the refining and chemical industries, another method is produced it using electricity to split water, a process known as electrolysis. This process is not an efficient use of energy, but it makes sense when the cost of electricity is free. So places where the electricity costs are cheap it's not a bad way to operate, but your point, I, I'm just speaking your point. And I, again, it's the article was the big read in the FT, January 1st, uh, 2019. Anybody interested in it should take a read just so you're aware of what the world is thinking. You know, that's what we care about. So we can yeah, be- Yeah, Eric, where the, so where the world um, I have at. a yeah. friend. I have a friend in China that he works for BYD the um, a huge yes but uh, yeah they talk about that yeah right. in yep. uh, battery operated cars so the mm -hmm. company um, conducted a research like three years ago back in 2016 when mm -hmm. they were planning um, to uh, ship from lithium ion to fuel cells and then Chinese government subsidized the whole research and development. But right. in the end, they found, okay, so um, they found to, to make a hydrogen fuel cell car is not that expensive. It's the operating cost for the uh, infrastructures that are expensive because cars I, are operated in dense populated areas. They are not rural methods of transportation. And the storage of hydrogen could pose a numerous of uh, security threats to a Chinese yeah. society. That's why they decided not to go down that road. It's because of the um, stability of the society. It's not the economic of scales or anything like that. It's not about the cost. It's the potential danger that it poses, the uh, hydrogen stations poses to the nearby neighborhoods. Uh -huh. They're okay. afraid I, yeah. that they will become targets to be attacked. Here's how Michael's on top of this because uh, it was uh, Wei Che Power that bought 20% uh, of uh, Ballard for 100. Um, so, and that's exactly they talk about some of these issues. But yet, the Chinese government, where they're not su subsidizing uh, uh, electric vehicles after 2020, they, they are signed on to uh, keep subsidizing these until 2025. Fuel cells. 
Yeah, because they're so deep into it. it it's very yeah. close. I mean, it's very close yeah. to mass production. It's just yeah. They, I think they're they're uh, researching how to make um, the uh, hydrogen transportation more reliable and more safely. You know, well, and I don't. Yeah, and that's it. Um, hydrogen stations in in uh, neighborhoods like gas stations yeah. in, in neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. they, they are they're gonna. Um, so let's say mm. one big city like Beijing. Okay, so they they're gonna yeah. put probably ten. Fueling stations around the city, and they they probably will convert the existing taxis to hydrogen fuel cells. That's my thought. Hmm. The taxis. Hmm. Well, I don't, not I don't think you. Cost. I don't think you can convert them. It's, they don't. They don't. No, it's not convert. It's to retire the uh, uh, fossil okay. fuel fleet. Okay. Yeah. But it, oh, oh, you know, uh, okay. Michael, these are all great points, and you're going to love reading the art. Get the article because I think, and I think everybody should read it. This should be a, you know, it's an investable discussion or not investable. I listen. I, I I'm laughing because the move up, and you can look at the chart and see how dynamic it's been. It's been dynamic. Um, not that that. So what? You know, but your points are very well taken. But I will lock up with you because. If the issue is the security of the hydrogen, you know, uh, as far as explosion, don't forget, I don't know if you saw yesterday, uh, Donald Trump was talking about uh, uh, putting into legislation the um, transport of LNG by train. I don't know if it, there was an article yesterday about it. And one of the guys who I do sit with is a very, the guy has been in the energy business his whole life and he knows a lot. And he said, well, those would be like just bombs on railroad tracks because LNG, you know, it's one of the things about liquid nat uh, liquefied natural gas is when you put those tankers out at sea, oh man, you know, it's, it's just a potential huge fireball. Yes. So, well, can't you say the same about propane, which is everywhere? Yeah. I mean, where I, you know, in rural America, is full of propane tanks. Oh, but to yeah. liquefy propane. propane and natural gas require much less pressure than hydrogen. Okay. Right. Yeah, but the transporting of them still is not. I mean, it's pretty dangerous. Uh, yeah. So they know, are. I was they, all they are inventing a way. To use um, um, uh, graphite, uh, the, those nano yeah, graphite tubes yeah. to store hydrogen yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. atoms. That's the way they're going mm. for. But this technology is relatively new, and they have yeah. limited success. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. I you know what I know that because uh, you know one of the guys who I talked to that elderly elderly he's ninety seven years old is working on graphite and graphene. For solar yeah, energy. Graphene, uh, nano graphene, nanographing tubes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. But, this, but again, we're only talking about this as alternatives to what may exist out there for investable ideas. Because if you think that in any sense at all that the U.S. equity market has been played out, because again, it's the 1999 argument, and. And, and Matt, if we go back and look at that S&P bond, and we're close to it. We're, what are we trading right now? We're trading... Uh, 21. Uh, just under it. Oh, hold on. 20, just under four. it? Yeah, 20, yeah. 20, uh, 848, I think, is last. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I need to see a new high in this for it to get... Because one thing I've learned, if markets put on rallies, 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 and yes, the S and P's themselves make new highs, but in, in this world of uh, unlimited uh, central bank intervention, you know, it's, to me that's a big yawn. Uh, so, so we'll we'll see if it does. If it does it, I I don't know. I still I'm not going to make the U.S. for 2020 the uh, the most 
desirable location for me to invest. And again, you know, it, it's, I'm, oh, wow, I'm looking for or had a move today, and, but I'm not getting sucked into it. Um, <laughs> it must, it must have been some sense of, uh, not sure I'm going to have to go follow that. I have not paid attention to it because it's pissed me off. Uh, and that's a bad way to, to trade, but pissed me off, no doubt. Um, well, Albemarle's up 10% almost already this week. Yeah. You know, it, it, the one that's really not moving, and is, I may, I am, I'm going to sit there for a while longer because I've been in the stock for six or seven years as Glencore. And, uh, with copper prices breaking out here, there's no question that now we're above the 285, which has been our uh, line of resistance for way too long. Um, uh, yeah, it may it may be time to to say goodnight, but uh, I am watching it closely. Good, but the, those are so, political factors. So one one of the questions that was banging out there was someone was asking about Brexit, and I'm and I'm kind of wondering. Something's uh, going on right now. Um, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt, but we just had a. Yeah, no, you're right. Break. Gold yeah. is moving. Yeah. Gold it took yeah. off. Bonds are rallying. What's What's uh, happened? The Chinese decide not to show up. What, what's yeah, this no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry. So uh, uh, Brexit, the FTSE, um, seems like uh, new opportunities. You know, Boris Johnson's mandate and. You know, a Brexit deal, which happens, and the Brussels has to negotiate all of a sudden. And then before they thought they could put, be the punisher, and now they they're gonna be the chaser. I, so, what do you think about the FTSE? Well, well, the FTSE is actually, you know, that was my key. To that when everybody was talking about the pound was gonna get crushed, and da, 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 I said, you know what? If you look at the FTSE and and the uh, guilt. People were running from uh, from investable in, in Britain, so that's why uh, it, it was uh, it didn't make sense, you know. When everybody when when everybody's predictions were so dire, I just didn't see it. It, it didn't make sense. Did anybody got I, I don't see any news here. Not, yeah, me either. Anybody got anything on but Twitter? Some, something happened. I got stopped out of longs and I bought them back real quick. Um, but so uh, I, the Brexit, you know, again, Boris Johnson is, we've talked about this, is a good strategic politician. And, and the Europeans have woken up to it. They're not going to steamroll him. And he thinks he's going to get a negotiation done as far as a trade deal. And he's probably right. So, you know, how do you play it? I don't know. You know, as I said, yeah, I actually made a really nice play in the pound. I'm out. I actually bought him back yesterday when it got down to uh, uh, 129.70 in that area because I thought it had some good risk factors. But I'm out. It's just it was just a trade, no more than that. You know, uh, well, you know, uh, the energy and uh, commodity stocks are a pretty small part of the S and P, but they're a pretty big part of the FTSE still, aren't they? I'm sorry. Uh, energy and commodity stocks are a pretty small part. My, of my, mining stocks uh, in the FTSE. You know, there's a lot of mining companies because of yeah, Britain's so, place in the world. So oh, if, there was a headline. U.S. officials denied there's a plan to cut China duties further. U.S. to verify China deal adherence before lifting tariffs. Uh, okay. So, uh, just... It was headlines written and the algo, the algos were on uh, spring break and uh, going wild. So, uh, which is fine with me. I was long at eighty nine. I took a little profit at ninety four. I got stopped out for a scratch, and the market came back down through the bottom of the opening range to eighty two half, and then popped back up, and I got long at eighty five quarter. All while we were talking. Yeah. All yeah. small. By I mean, the way, you, all small size. But but you see the way. The al the algos dro drove this market with their correlations. Mm -hmm. right. They all went in sync, right? Right? Boom! 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 That's that's the most interesting thing to me is that they all just said, "Hey, okay," and 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 they just followed right in right in line. 
I mean, that, that really is. So those, those, the way that, the way that I was taught to trade uh, the opening range by Judd and, and, and well, all of you guys really by extension, and then, and then how to manage my positions around the same way that you did around, around uh, uh, Howard, how, how all stuff, the, the gnome of Valparaiso as Judd calls him, you know, the, it was, um, and then that I had to relearn again on the screens is just a matter of having a plan and then reacting around that plan. And I've got the plan. Mm -hmm. I've got the levels. I know what I'm going to do and I know where I'm going to execute. And because I've already taken a couple of trades during the day and it's midday, I cut my size, but I still put them back on. Yeah. And I remove yep. my risk and now I can stay. I paid for my trade. I remove my risk. My stops for break even again. And I can now, if the algos want to take them back, then go ahead. We'll see what happens. But the algos, you, you know, yeah. the, and that's what I mean, I re, is that I've I've had to learn how to make the algos my friends. I've had to learn how to make the algos work for me. We're, we're not market makers anymore. We're market takers, and it took me a long time to figure that out. Yeah, you're you you are Buffett. You're a value investor trying to utilize. You know that's why you know my my consistently urging patients. Yes. Yes. Always urging patience and, you know, and, and, and patience, a word that not too many traders actually take the time to, to define, but we do. And the way that I define it is the way that, that uh, Judd defined it for me, which was all based on the same way both you guys were, 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 were trained, you know? So Ira being my, my, uh, my trading father would be like you then being my uncle. I wouldn't say grandfather. Yeah. 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 It's okay. That's okay. You, can, you know, at the, or as uh, as my grandchildren call me, Poppy Ira. You can call <laughs> me Poppy Ira. Poppy Ira, thank you. Okay. I like yeah. that, Poppy Ira. Yeah, that's what they call me, Poppy. But the, the, uh, the grammar schools in uh, Maryland were resonating with the yells of Poppy Ira. Poppy Ira! Yeah. <laughs> and, and my son, and my son, who had his six-year-old my my grand who's almost six years old uh trader joe sell these bags of chocolate uh gold coins or they're not they're not gold they're different world currencies yeah. trader joe has them so i'm sitting on the couch and he comes running in with with a euro and he goes poppy i hear you love the euro <laughs> you want one? I said, get out of here Nathan. that's brilliant <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's yeah, they had they 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 had a they had a great. I said, but my son was laughing very hard in the other room. Um, uh, yeah, I loved you. I said I don't dislike it like I used to, but because uh, I I see where we're going. But uh, so that's uh, what else we got. Now what, something else came out because here we're going. At, we're taking another bite at that apple, so to speak. Yeah, I flattened up. I'm not going to do it again. I took that. Yeah. I took that second shot, and if they take them back up, then they do. But I'm not going to take another shot at that. So whatever they did, they did. But I, you know, I've got another question. Um, oh, Terry, Terry Biondo had a. Uh, okay, I think we talked about that. What, what are, uh, Terry's question was? What are your thoughts on the similarities between 2000 and and now? Okay, we are we talked about mm -hmm. that. Uh, but all right, what the. The um, uh, I didn't, I haven't had time to delve too deeply into it, but I saw an article last night on Zero Hedge, and I have haven't gone through my entire uh, FT yet. But what is uh, what's going on with the 82B injected into the repo market now? This new 82 billion. You yeah, well, I, I think it helped rally the stock market. Well, yeah, you know, it was oversubscribed. The, the the term repo was oversubscribed. But the overnight was not. So, you know, there's two different things going on. So why did somebody want to ensure that they had, uh, well, not just them, but a lot of players want to ensure that they had a lot of liquidity, that they had met uh, liquidity needs going forward. So um, I, I, don't, I don't know, but it certainly, I think, helped with the stock market from its overnight uh, sell-off when people saw oh, and the and the Fed was willing to meet that demand, so uh, hmm. I I don't I, I really can't speak to it more than that, but I I think that uh, 
I so mean, it's definitely a part part of the uh, game going on. Yeah, listen, they're not going anywhere. No. So if you if you liked what you saw in 2019, and again, so if and if profits aren't growing, the only thing that can grow, of course, is the uh, is, is the PE ratio, because that's really what we're doing. We're just uh, we're just pushing out PE ratios. So why not? That's that's what we're doing. End of story. And because again, the, everybody's betting on increased profits, but you know profits have not been that great. And I'm, you know what? I, I know I know the bank profits were were great. To, you know, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, how are they making them? Oh, they're making them trading. J.P. Morgan made a hell of a lot of money trading fixed income. Well, that's a that's an interesting conversation in itself. Yeah, I saw an interview. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw this yesterday morning on Bloomberg with David Kelly from JPM. Uh, I, and I usually enjoy listening to him. And, and uh, he, he ended up coming up with a very, very good line. But he's 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 a bit bearish equities this year. And um, uh, uh, the line that he had was that uh, the stock market is right now equities are being held up on sugar and no protein. That was a very good. Oh, that's line. a great, yeah, great line. Yeah, that's great line. I mean, coffee out. Somebody just sent me uh, Jim Rogers. I guess was on somewhere. You know, listen. A lot of people have been very wrong. All you do is have to look at the price of uh, Tesla, because there were an awful lot of bear, a lot of short positions in Tesla by some very sophisticated short sellers. That's yeah. Uh, and and right but that just goes back so even it, to our conversation last week is you know we're we're uh, it looks like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of downside risk for equities coming up in the in 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 the next coming you know days weeks months um or year obviously and and uh but going back to to that old keynesian saying and the markets can remain irrational for longer than we can remain solvent as evidenced by the another 82 billion injected into the market to keep things solid. In my opinion, keep things solid and propped up until at least without having any real knowledge of the way that the plumbing works in the repo market, but just to keep the markets um, steady until after uh, this phase one deal can, can, can be signed. Well, and then what happens? To keep the, to keep the market very liquid. Again, yes. that's what they do. And, that, and so yeah. they, they live, what is the Fed living in fear of? A fear of because uh, they've gone down this path and, and they've been very aggressive in doing it. I mean, that, those are huge liquidity ads. <laughs> we're, not, we're not talking small numbers. <laughs> and you know what? And, and you know what? Here's some, and I'm, I'm gonna. I only got about five more minutes because I'm doing. I'm interviewing with the uh, nominating committee today for the IMM seat. Um, so uh, somebody made this point, and I, I, I really, I, I, I didn't write it down, but it was really a good point. Everybody talks about wages and inflation, right? Uh -huh. Well, we've had five, five financial crises in in the last 35 years <laughs> we had you know the we had the uh, stock market uh, we had the savings and loan crisis we had the uh, mexican peso crisis well, let's see we may have had more we had the long term capital and of course we had the great financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 and we you know and of course, the uh, the massive sell-off in the Nasdaq and other stocks in 2000, and not one of them have been a result of inflation uh -uh. or high or high wages. Wonderful point. Yeah, so interesting. R right? They've all been the result <laughs> of central bank actions. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, Long-term capital was uh, that was my that was my first experience. 
It was the first one yeah. that I that I that I was in the business to experience. Well, no, Mexican peso crisis too, but long term capital was the first one that I really paid attention to. Yeah, and that was that was a super interesting. <laughs> that was a very yeah, cause interesting. Because if you didn't, you were going to get your ass handed to you. Yes, because that that created. Believe me, I was helping Jimmy Olaf, uh, who's just a to me a wonderful and dear person. How I was he he was filling believe it or not orders in the rubles he he was he was holding the the ruble which was busy even before rubles and brazilian real which were really the emerging currencies just starting to take off so i was helping him out because he was just inundated inundated and i said don't worry about what the customers i really i said just chill you know you were you were just trying to get prices it was the long long term capital was a uh, a major event but none of these, not one of them, was due to inflation or wages. No. Great point. And with that, you know, what else can you say? So what is the Fed reacting to? What are they afraid of? What is going on here? But afraid they are. And they don't take baby steps, by the way. Uh -uh. These are not baby steps. The amount of liquidity they've added since September is anything but a baby step. And when you really think about it, it's massive because it was, well, I think, last May that they ended the quantitative tightening. Okay. But they've gone way beyond any quantitative tightening where they've built the balance sheet almost back, if not more, than it was. Yeah. And there's more coming. They're going to do this, as Richard Clare uh, has told us, through at least through April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, that, and they'll extend it through that, too. There's no stopping at this point. They can't. It's... You know, and again, I I, I really owe, owe the person who, who said that because they're 100 percent right. There, there had, maybe it was John Authors. I don't know. I forgot where I've, I've been reading so much uh, and traveling. So uh, I, you know, it, it's a very, it's a it's a very solid point. What is the what are the central banks so afraid of? Because they just can't let go. They can't let go. And, and and the pivot, the Powell pivot of January 2019, following on the, uh, you know, what was it, a 21, 22% drop in the S&P in the last quarter? Uh, somebody want to do the math for uh, for all of us? Hold on. Let's see. I can't do it. Don't ask me. I'm Irish. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So the low <laughs> in December... The low on December 24th, uh, to, uh, 2018, the low in the S&P was 2340. And it broke for, uh, from that October 3rd that we talked about from 2944. So basically, uh, six, uh, six, uh, 600 handles. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so what was it? So about, uh, I think, 22, 23%. Was that the break? Yeah, it must yeah. be. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, Equal move up. In my head, but uh, yeah, six over. Okay. Yeah, that's probably about right. So you had that move, and what did we take back? That's what we took back. Yeah, we went and made new highs, and we added on another seven percent. So really, when you look at it, once the Fed forced its pivot, it just took back everything that it did, which is, of course, was those seven cuts added on with another seven or eight percent. And that's been the whole move. So yeah, it could it could run a little higher, but it's all due to Fed action. It's all due to Fed action. The, the earnings across the board are just not there to support this type of movement. No. Just not. It's just not. And what says it most, and that's with massive amounts of stock buybacks. So moving these prices up the earnings are definitely aren't there because a lot of it is massaged by finding what well, you know we can nicely call financial engineering and stock by uh and and corporate tax cuts and other forms of yeah stimulus. well that you got yeah, right but i think those have went their way out of the uh the market already we're done but i mean so that's the picture so when i say on a relative basis that i don't think you know i think it's that the u.s is not the best value going forward. And I'm telling you, if it is, 
then it's really going to have problems. It's, it's going to uh, fall on, a, on its own weight. So that, that's the way I see it. Well, I know you have to go. Uh, yep. I wish you, I wish you, uh, you know, obviously I wish you well. Um, there's, there's a, a couple of guys that still own their IMMs in here. And so we'll make sure that, yeah. you know, when yeah. it comes time, we'll, we'll, we'll garner our support yeah. for you. I, I yeah, thank you. You know, I just, it, that's, I can't solicit, nor will I solicit. No, of course not. You know, every, everybody who knows me, uh, knows if you. you want that voice, yeah, that's it. You know, that's all. I, you know, it's, uh, I bring the passion to that. And I know, and I know Marcus, that, that's the end of, at the end of the day, that's, a, that's what I bring. That's what I know. Um, uh, and I understand risk very well. Otherwise I wouldn't still be here. So, uh, all right. Thanks for your indulgence. And, uh, I think we covered a lot of ground and I'm telling you, especially Michael, get that article. You'll really enjoy it. Michael, I think I have it for you. I'll find it for you. If it was in the FT, I got it. One, I, I wanted to, I just want to point out one more thing. Um, in, in, in a, in a farewell note, kind of, uh, I had explained to everybody last week that, that all of us here trading or in, in fact, anybody around the world trading on the screens has, uh, owes you a debt of gratitude. If it wasn't for you spearheading this for Leo, um, I'd be driving a, a, a squad car around Chicago someplace, or maybe I'd be in the back of that squad car. <laughs> Hopefully I'd be driving it. I'd be a cop or a fireman. Um, but because you guys spearheaded through Globex and, and um, screen-based trading and made the CME what it is. So, you know, we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Go, go, go get them today, please. Keep us going. It was Mohammed's vision of seeing where it was. You know, you can disagree with Leo, but I was there, and I'm telling you, it was his vision. But as as always, it takes it takes uh, people to put it into action. Uh, that's the whole thing. You can theoretically have a lot of ideas, but without the practicability and putting it into action, it's just another good idea. That's exactly and you right. know what? The walls are papered with people's good ideas never put into action. That's absolutely right. Uh, uh, Leo needed good soldiers. You know, as, as Terry, as Terry introduced me to John McCain as, as his good soldier, he, uh, Leo needed soldiers to get that passed through. No, Otherwise it would right. never have gone. No, absolutely. And he, he's, uh, he's writing a book about it. So we'll wait for it to come up. I talked to Jordy last week. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. You know what? I had coffee with Jordy last week. Yeah, we were supposed to go together too. He stiffed me. Maybe he stiffed me for you. Huh. No, no, he was he was here in Phoenix. So we we went uh and had a coffee because I saw him uh as mom and dad's in uh Paradise Valley and then we, we went. I know he's working on a big project. So yeah. was, he was here in Chicago offer. too. Just a, yeah. a week or so before that, he was here in Chicago and we we were meant to get together to talk about that project and, and I I've been lending stories and ear and you know different things to it. So. Right. Right. It's going to be same, fun. Same thing I was doing. All right. Well, tell him that you just talked to Ira and what the hell are you doing? That's all. I will. I'll bust his nuts about that. Okay. One. Thank you, Ira. Good luck and God bless. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. All right. All right. Thanks.